Hello and welcome to Eavesdropping at the Movies. I'm Mike. And I'm Jose. And today we're talking about The Marvellous Mabel Normand, which is not a film in its own right. It's a collection of four films programmed by the BFI. Yes. Starring Mabel Normand, a uh, silent star of the uh, 1910s, 1920s. And these films are uh, directed and co-directed by her. Uh, They star alongside her Charlie Chaplin, uh, Fatty Arbuckle, uh, a young Oliver Hardy. Yes. In the in the last one of, from 1927, they're accompanied as well by a newly commissioned score by the Meg Morley Trio, who were there performing it. This was it was put on by Flatpak in Birmingham, at the Cathedral, in Pigeon Park in the middle, which was nice. Yes. It was quite a nice that- projection, nice big screen, and nice place to be. Yes, it was lovely. I kind of um, one of the things that I love about Flatpak is actually these these pop-up screenings that they do where... Uh, yeah, know, it's not, not part of the main festival, which is on in April, but they do screenings around the rest of the year as well. That's this right. Those. And, and, and what I love about them is that, you know, it brings people to spaces that they wouldn't normally go to, mm. i.e., you know, unless you're a Christian or observant or, you know, you would not normally go into Birmingham Cathedral... Uh, so, you know, if you go, uh, some people, the very first time they go is when they go see a movie like this and like that for other spaces, you know, for, for the old college of art and, um, they've used cinemas, they've used banks. It's, it's, it's really great. I think the way that they do that, it's a way of reintroducing people to the city that they live in through kind of slightly tangential context. Uh, and this is one of them. I'd, I'd been before to see, um, Dreyer's Passion of Joan of Arc. Yeah. Um, and kind of there is there is actually something about watching these films in the church, particularly the Passion of Joan of Arc. Yeah, uh, yeah. Though this felt different, obviously, because they were comedies, uh, and they were very successful comedies. Like, you know, kind of the the films are over a hundred years old, some of them, and they still made me laugh. They still feel fresh. I thought two of them were successful. Uh, which two? Uh, the latter two. So what? So the films in the in the in the program are Mabel's Blunder from 1914, Mabel's Dramatic Career from 1913, His Trysting Place from 1914, and Should Men Walk Home from 1927. And it's the latter two that I liked. The first two I thought were pretty boring. Oh, I didn't find funny. them boring. I thought I thought she was marvelous. Um, I thought she was incandescent. I thought she was brilliant. Uh, I didn't. Uh, Okay. I thought she was only good in the latter two, and I. But that. But then I thought the only latter two were good, pretty much in any way. I. I, I really felt very bored and kind of confused by the first two. I thought they weren't funny enough. Oh, I can't, well, they like, can't tell. The and, plot. And, they, and they weren't getting laughs from the audience either. Well, the, the plot, roughly speaking, of Mabel's blunder is uh, she works in an office. She's um, going out with uh, the boss's son, and the boss is also into her, um, and she then. Uh, believes that the boss's son is going off with some other woman mm. and so she sort of chases them down and follows them around and sneaks and this that, and the other uh, the twist at the very end uh, spoilers is it's actually his sister yeah. and they were just hanging out together and it was it was her blunder yes and um, the plot of Mabel's dramatic career is she's going out with this farmer guy yeah who's quite scruffy um, his mum is not not into it she's yes. quite a sort of the uptight mother, sort of mother-in-law type. Um, Mabel ends up getting kicked out of the house, basically, and sort of the, the engagement is called off. Um, and she goes to make it in the movies. And then the, the kind of latter half of that short is the farmer chap seeing a movie that she appears in and sort of he, he still loves her. And he's kind of he kind of fights with the movie while it's on screen. He kind of he tries to fight the villain while but through the movie yeah so it's, it's kind of his sort of delusion in a way yeah. not not delusion but you know he's sort of his his passion over overtakes him yes and uh he's kind of riled up and ruins the movie for the audience i i love that i mean I, that was a fun idea i mean i kind of agree that obviously the chaplain one is a masterpiece i i think well we'll get on to the latter yeah but the first um, two. Well, what I'm trying to say is that it's true that the latter two are better. Mm. 
you know, but I love seeing the first two. I mean, and actually there was something about Mabel Norman. You remember the beginning, she's typing with her boss, right? Mm. And actually just the way she typed, I found funny and engaging, Yeah. you know, and kind of all her facial gestures and, you know, she's, she's so alive in the film. It was for me just like a pleasure to watch her. And, and, you know, she's a very pretty woman, a very sexy woman, and she's very funny, you know, mm. which is kind of not usual. <laughs> well, I don't know. I wasn't really taken by any of that, to be honest. Like, I can see what you mean. She, I mean, and again, it comes comes out more in the latter two films that her um, her face expressions and these kind of beautiful big eyes that she has, yes. and when she kind of looks in one direction or another, just with her eyes. So you get this kind of you see the the whites of her eyes, kind yes. of, and the, 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 it's like um, you know, the, the cartoony almost, cartoony, yeah. very expressive. Um, I do like that, and you know, there are kind of aspects to a sort of physical performance. Again, in a kind of in that in that sort of quote unquote silent film mode of being you know, kind of um, almost like mime, yes. you know, heavily sort of exaggerated movements. Again, yes. kind of cartoony. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, they're communicating they're, to the audience like, yeah, you know, very directly. You know, yeah, and actually, they are communicating to the audience. It's it's almost like they point to it, like look at this baby, <laughs> or look at the situation, or yeah. you know, so. Kind of, um, and in in the very first film, um, Mabel's Blunder, there's there's very very little, by way of, um, uh, intertitles explaining things. Mm. You get a couple right at the start, basically, and then everything else is really done through, through kind of situation and gesture and blocking mm. And, mm. and and mime and so on, and kind of figuring out, in in, in terms of communicating to the audience, yeah, you know, everything they need to know. Whereas whereas the second film had an awful lot more. In terms of explaining things, um, sort of, sort of piece by piece in in into titles, mm. saying and now this happens and now this happens and mm. now it's this character. And, um, so the second one was easier to follow. Yeah. Um, I think the first one did get kind of confusing. I thought, is this, well, I, I I just was a little bit confused at points when they introduced a whole cast of characters by the end. And I thought, who are these people? No, but um, I, I didn't. Uh, but it was kind of simple. Um, ultimately, I guess that she just. Think she's going off with some other woman. Yes. Um, but no, they did fail to engage me the first time. You know, that's it's it's about that simple. Um, and I don't think it's a case that they're the products of their time because they're from 1914 and 1913, and the Chaplin one is 1914, and I thought it was fantastic. Yes. You know, and I loved every bit of it. Yeah. But the other thing is, 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 and you might disagree with me on this, but the the um, the intro before. They played the four films. There's an intro that appears on screen. It's this whole BFI program, so it's from the BFI, saying um, this and the other. That here's Mabel Norman. Here's the people she was appearing with. But make no mistake, Mabel Norman is the star. And, and you know, in the third one, that ain't true. It's Joel Chaplin, um, and he was getting huge laughs from the audience. He was. Um, that's true. She was fantastic, though, and their interplay was fantastic. Mm. Um, yeah I mean the thing with being with Chaplin is like really he is a genius you know there's no question about it I mean everything he did was funny um, but she was great too you know she was good um, but it, certainly in the it, seeing the Chaplin one amongst three films in which he doesn't appear if you kind of thought oh Chaplin's played out he's sentimental blah 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 whatever it is all the various problems that people have with Chaplin to see the Chaplin film amongst those other three, you go, this is why he's a genius. It makes it so clear. Yes. I know. I think that's true. You know, but I thought she was brilliant. And actually, you understand completely why she was such a big star. And actually, the other thing that she has, you know, that to me, Chaplin doesn't have, mm. is that she's a great actress. Like, you, you feel that she's transparent, that you, you, you understand whatever it is that she's feeling. You know? Yeah, that's true. Um, whereas with Chaplin, you know, kind of, he's performing a shtick, right? And he's absolutely brilliant. You know, there's almost no one better. But actually, you don't feel like you're looking in his soul or anything, right? You're looking at, you know, at this performance that he's giving you, right? Perhaps. But, and but the situation is made very clear. But with, with Mabel Norman, there's something about her eye. You really, you really get the sense of a person feeling, you know? And she's also performing and she also does things with her eyes and... You know, the gestures, I love it when she spits in her hand when she's about to sock him. You know, so it's not as if she doesn't have her shtick. But there is something about her face that you get a sense of a of a feeling person. 
Yeah, I think that's true. Though she also does have material to work with here that I think Chaplin doesn't in particular, in this particular film. He's not He's not kind of downtrodden or anything like that. He is a, a source of fun, basically. And it's, and it's her character as his wife who is... I mean, what you see right at the start of the film, she's kind of cooking and dealing with the baby and all this while he's just sitting there with his feet up trying to read newspaper. So she's the one who is who has a kind of malaise to express that he doesn't. Mm. You know, like the, uh, the closest he comes to it really is being annoyed that he has to take care of the baby, but it's it is it's cartoony. That's mm. all it is from him. Anyway, she pops. She she pops alive. And actually, I thought that was even more interesting in the last film. Uh, what was it called? Um, the last one was um, the Chaplin one was called His Trysting Place. From 1914, and the last one is Should Men Walk Home from 1927. Yes, which is about a couple of burglars. It's a couple of burglars who meet and they try to con each other, and then they end up trying to pull a job in a billionaire's house. Um, and there also, I thought it was interesting because there as well, she's not quite the star. Yeah, kind of. It's certainly a two-hander. Yeah, I think the you know the guy has at least as much to do as her, but I think she steals the show, and she steals the show with a lot. With 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 a um a lot less to do than he than he does. He gets a big production number in a fountain, <laughs> right? Uh, she doesn't get any of that. Um, he does. I think his his part in the fountain though um, is the for me that was kind of central set piece, and again that was getting the biggest laughs from the audience. But that's not because of the actor. I mean, that's because of the situation and the way that it's filmed. A little bit. I think the actor got. I mean, the actor, the performance was. A big part of it. It's a you know, the way that the way that a, when he puts it's his, a part of it. He replaces he replaces one of the gargoyles and he pretends to be one. It's rather like that um, uh, in Austin Powers three when he when uh, do you remember Austin Powers having to pretend to be the the peeing statue? Um, it's essentially the same set piece as that, but it's done. He's spitting out of his mouth instead of trying, pretending to wee. But it's but there are shots where the guy the detective is looking straight at him, knowing that it's him, and he's sort of he's sort of pretending to carry on. But he's like looking directly at the guy, sort of smirking. It's a quite a funny performance because I think it's a great piece it's, of direction. It's it's quite uh, it's quite an unusual performance because, like, there's there's essentially there's no question that he that he's actually convincing anyone that he is this gargoyle, but he's just carrying on but and that's having why, fun. That's but I think that's a that's the direction mm-hmm. and that's kind of like the architecture of the scene and the way that it's kind of like you know comically designed. You know, but and and the actor's a part of it, but you know he's not the main part of it. Whereas mm. actually, I think Mabel Norman gets very little to do. And there's something at the very beginning, for example, when the car tries to run her down, and she ends up kind of running in those high heels, you know, and getting out of the way by leaping onto, you know, this higher ground. Mm. I mean, even just the way she moves is funny, mm. right? You know, so and I think that's very much due to her performance and not to a whole routine kind of being built around her, which actually, it's true that, um, you know, she doesn't get those big routines in that, in, in, um, in that film. So well, she doesn't, she doesn't get one as good as his for sure. Um, but, um, you know, she does have the whole sort of, uh, sifting through the soup, for instance, you know, and, 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 she, and, and fighting with, fighting with Oliver Hardy about, about getting his soup off him. Yeah, and he keeps on trying to come back and get... That's the punch. A punch, sorry, yeah. whatever, yeah. Um, yeah, but but then he gets that and ends up on in the fountain. You know, so she obviously she gets things to do, but I think there's nothing as spectacular as he gets, and yet she's, you know, she's incredibly alive uh, uh, and, and just so charismatic. I mean, you know, I kind of... I wouldn't even be able to draw his face now if you asked me to. I'm, I, I, you know, kind of... We've just seen the film... And though he was fine, I don't mean to criticize the actor, but, you know, I would be hard-pressed to kind of distinguishing from someone else. Whereas to me, she's vivid and alive and, mm. you know, and, and, and fascinating. And I'm not just saying that because that's what the program is no, built no. around. I, uh, I, thought she was, I thought she was kind of fine, but I, th- I thought the films were kind of... I, I mean, I, I, she didn't elevate the first two films in the way that a, a, a great performer would have, I don't think. Well, for me, she did. Uh, as I said, you know, kind of, I love the way that she indicates with her eyes. You know, there were so many little bits of business, like, you know, just the way that she typed. 
um, you know, I kind of, uh, um, when she was in taking the dictation, you know, just kind of the way that she moved and the way that she looked at him, you know, kind of all of those things were like timed, really. I thought she was brilliant. Um, Fair enough. I didn't see it myself. I didn't hate her, you know, I can't, I liked her. Like I say, I think, I think in, in the better films, she was better as well. She was part of that, you know, clearly. Mm. But um, I don't think she was, you know, like I say, when it says at the start, make no mistake, Mabel Norman was a star. I kind of feel like, I feel like, I don't know if she was really. Oh, well, I, 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 I had never seen her before this and I am completely convinced. I mean, to me, she is a revelation. Mm. Yeah. Good deal. Um, no, she is. Big words. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, her look, her eyes, her movement, you know, that whole skit with the baby, I mean, you know, that takes extraordinary timing and it's timed with Chaplin. They were almost all done in long takes, hmm. you know, kind of. So he's a genius, but she's holding her own, hmm. right? And kind of, and I think being much more, you get much more of a sense of a feeling person with her, that she's a real person, you know, not like, you know, this created character that is Chaplin's... Well, he's not really the tramp in this, is no. he? He's just a husband. But but he's already like the tramp in, in some ways as well, right? You know, part of the walk, the outfit, the bowler hat, you know, the moustache. I mean, he's like the attitude. You know. Yeah. Uh, so, I kind of... I, I'm, you know, I was very impressed. Um, and actually, all the, you know, all the fight scenes in the park were brilliant. I also loved the other woman, you know, who acted very broad, yeah? Oh, the one on the bench. The one on the yeah. bench, yeah. you know. I thought it was wonderful because, you know, I mean, she was very much like pantomime acting, mm. like completely out there, like a cartoon, you know, but yeah. it worked so brilliantly. She, she is the absolute classic annoyed woman on a bench. Yeah. Inside, like, it, um, it's, it seems it's an archetype all of its own, I think. Yeah. The woman who's not interested. I mean, and this is actually one of the points where I thought, oh God, that, this is why Ch- Chaplin's a genius. Which is when he um, he sort of starts to try and cry on her. He doesn't know who she is. She, yeah. She's just a woman on the bench, and for whatever reason, he just starts trying to sort of open up and moan and, and cry on her. And she's not interested, and she moves away. And he's trying to lie on her, and he gets his cane and pulls her legs towards him <laughs> so he can lie on them. Yeah. I thought that's a wonderful. That's a that's a brilliant brilliant idea, brilliant moment. Oh my god! Because so, it's it, and and it's that thing of. Again, it's super cartoony. Like you would never do this in real life. You wouldn't do anything close to it. But it makes perfect sense that he would just be so self obsessed yes. that he would think I can I can get away with with yanking someone's legs towards that me. That whole routine is brilliant. It was lovely. I mean, you know, that got a big laugh from me. Yeah, um, it's so beautifully choreographed. So you know, he's crying. He needs a handkerchief. He takes his handkerchief. He blows his nose <laughs> a lot, and then just throws it on her lap. <laughs> and then she puts it up her sleeve. I mean, my God, that must have taken so long to choreograph that whole thing. It's absolutely mm. brilliant. Uh, I like the um, I like the score as well. Ah, uh, yes. Which we should probably mention. As I say, it was performed. It was performed live by the Meg Morley Trio, um, who uh, composed it as well. Yes. It was a piano and a double bass and a drum kit. Mm. Uh, but that's the trio. And yeah, I thought it was. I mean that that elevated the movies. Well, for sure. C- certainly, the first couple it, it made it thought... lively and engaging and interesting, and and combined with the, it timed really beautifully with the action as well. I thought too much, though. Maybe it maybe a little bit too much in the first one for me. Yeah, you know, so kind of you feel that your whole body shaking to the music, in the, you know, in the first few. Or maybe <laughs> it might have just been the first one, you know. But like, there is something about having a live band there. Right, and then just the rhythm, and you you find your whole body is moving to the rhythm, mm. and but actually that you're losing the rhythm of the film, you know. I thought it was like, okay. you know, I I I I thought that was a bit uh, uh, too much, really. I love the score uh, of the last two, and I particularly kind of love the changes. Yes, you know that they they brought in. Uh, uh, so so I think the you know the live orchestra definitely elevated the whole thing. Mm. But I did think that, you know, that sometimes there was too much music. I think in the first one, it, it, it certainly, um, the score uh, kind of contributed to the feeling of chaos in the kind of chases towards the end that probably also contributed to my confusion as to exactly like what the fuck was supposed to be going on. Yeah. Um, but one thing that I really liked in the in the last film, the burglary film, uh, during that set piece uh, where, where in, in the fountain, 
is that the score was completely dropped out during that set piece, mm. and it and it became almost like Rafifi. <laughs> like yeah. it was it was all about just just the action, and actually the score at that point dropping out means the the action and in the direction and what have you is completely privileged, and because there, there's no need to to elevate that. It is so funny on its own. Yes, that there's no need to to add anything, and actually it, it would be to, to its detriment if they did and I really appreciate that and I thought it was a really good decision the last one is directed by Leo McCary right who is kind of one of the great directors uh, uh, of screwballs and you know of classic comedies and um, you know he directed my mind is going the Bing Crosby film where he plays a priest uh, and the sequel with Ingrid Bergman the bells of St. Mary is the sequel Going my way. Going my way. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, Best director for going my way. Yes, I hate those films. I think they're <laughs> like, I think they're like Catholic propaganda, uh, and I really despise them. Um, so, uh, I, I I love his nineteen thirties comedies, but I thought those are like really sentimental, and they're really Catholic propaganda, and very conservative. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, but, you know, as we can see from this film, kind of very few people organize kind of, you know, a comic scene better than he does, really. And he also kind of did very famous melodramas, yeah? An Affair to Remember is, is one of them. He became really conservative and really reactionary. Uh, so he made uh, My Son John, which I think is about communism and how horrible it is. And I think actually going my way the bells of St. Mary and then it really begins to become like annoying mm. but my favorite wife love affair the awful truth I mean those are like some of the great kind of classics of Hollywood cinema and of course not to speak of duck soup and uh, um, and so on so uh, and you can see kind of in this film yeah in that little short yeah how marvelously directed it is mm. yeah like a, you know, kind of, I mean, there is a great kind of comic imagination with an, with, an, with an architecture, like everything is structured, you know, and it's kind of like structured around rhythms, around audience expectations, around surprise, you know, I, and I, I kind of, I thought that was brilliant. And the other, the other name that we haven't mentioned amongst these films, we mentioned Chaplin and we mentioned um, Fatty Arbuckle and, um, and Stan Laurel. Uh, uh, Oliver Hardy. Oh, sorry, Oliver Hardy. Oliver Hardy, yeah. who, who is you can tell, he's very, very. And Eugene Pallet. And you, Eugene Pallet, very young Oliver Hardy in that. In that yes, he was film. wonderful. And he's just playing a you know kind of a supporting part in that. The other name is Max Sennett. Yes. Um, who she, uh, I think, was kind of one of her main collaborators, uh, yes. Sonia Keystone, and who plays in fact the that farmer. Oh, character. I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He okay. plays the farmer character in the the second film, the one the dramatic yes. career one. Um, and I think directed it. Yes. Who you know, he was he was an interesting thing, figure to look at, wasn't he? <laughs> yes. I mean, well, he had his own studio, and these yeah, films yeah. were like massively popular, and a lot of people got their start with him. Gloria Swanson got his start with him as a as a, a Max Sennett bathing beauty. Yeah. I think Carol Lombard got uh, her start with him. I mean, he was seen as being like you know one of the leading purveyors of comedies. And you know broad slapstick comedies in the teens and uh, and twenties, and very successful until, um, well, I can't I actually I can't remember now. I think I might be getting him kind of mixed up with Hal Roach, mm. um, you know, because Hal Roach continued into the thirties and forties. I'm not sure that Max Sennett did, but anyway, you know, maybe one of the reasons that Max Sennett is slightly forgotten these days. You know, you you remember the names of Fatty Arbuck and Charlie Chaplin and. And uh, and Hal Roach and, and but but Max in it tends to it tends to feel a little bit older tends to feel a little bit more of his time in a way. No, and, no, I, you you remember the name because yeah, you know yeah. like all of those shorts carry his name. They're all kind of Max Sennett films and you know sure, Max. But, yeah, but you know what I mean. Like he's not like he, he's not the first name that comes to mind when people think of silent film in the way that he should be. I'm talking about in terms of like popular sort of yeah, yeah. understanding. Obviously, of, film 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 aficionados will. will see him as like one of the, the key major players in particular if you are a silent 
film geek, then, you know, yeah, he's like, you know, one of the mainstays, right? Like one of the central people. But it's true that, you know, if you're not... Your regular man on the street will know not, Charlie yeah. Chaplin and may know kind of Buster Keaton. Yes. Um, um, but won't have a chance of, of knowing Max Sennett's name. Off yes. The head. I mean, I was very surprised, you know, like uh, kind of in the last year, I've traveled to all these places and some of them, you know, like Istanbul, right? Like, mm. you know, you can go into a market and buy Charlie Chaplin statues, Charlie Chaplin piggy banks, Charlie Chaplin umbrellas. I mean, it's, you know, you yeah. saw more Charlie Chaplin than you saw, I don't know, Marilyn Monroe. Or, I mean, you know, it's you yeah. barely saw any of that, in fact. I mean, but it was just shocking how Chaplin lives, you know. Mm. Uh, so, and, and how Mabel Norman doesn't. I mean, there was no Mabel Norman, you mm. know, statues or umbrellas, right? But Chaplin was... Uh, well, I'd not everywhere. heard of Mabel, unless, unless I'd come across it during, because I did study silent cinema uh, with, with John at um at uni and so you know i may have come across to them but it, but obviously never stuck with me because to my knowledge this is the first mabel norman that i've seen to my knowledge this is the first mabel norman that i've seen as well in fact you know i was worried at the end we checked at the beginning because um i love chaplin's a woman of paris and i thought that maybe the star of a woman of paris might have been mabel norman but in fact it ended up being edna Purviance, who is wonderful in the film it's a wonderful wonderful film um so so in fact i ca i i don't remember having seen her before either no. is... she did um she had her own production company as well um uh, it was mentioned i don't know that they was responsible for any of the films that we saw today i don't it, know um but uh, it was it was mentioned amongst the uh amongst the sort of blurb at the start of the of the program and um she died when she was 37 yeah it's very young very young it did what this program of films was meant to do which is kind of spark an interest in this figure. I mean, I would be very, very happy to see many, many more uh, Mabel Norman films and to explore her career, actually. You know, so um, I Fair. think, you know... I'd be happy to see more as long as they also had Charlie Chaplin in. Uh, <laughs> 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 she did have a partnership. I, I actually would be interested in finding more of the ones that she directed and produced and yeah. so on. I mean, you know, in that respect, it seems that, you know, she might be like a kind of a key figure, you know, so kind of a, you know, I mean, there obviously there were many women directing in the silent period. It actually, they only began to be like excluded to the extent that they were with sound. I mean, all the major female stars, I think, you know, had directed, Lillian Gish directed and Dorothy Gish directed and, you know, and, and, and Gloria Swanson had her own production company and blah, blah. Mm. So, but still, I think um, I was delighted by what I saw and I would like to know more. Lovely. So, and I you. And I had a good time too, in, in, in parts. <laughs> okay, thank you, Grinch. <laughs> 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 uh, 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 uh. Um, um, but uh, thank you to Flatpak, Flatpak for putting it on. Yes. Um, and, we, um, you know, as you say, these um these events sort of that pop up in and around Birmingham, um, are exciting and interesting, yes. and you know it takes a, it takes a an organisation like Flatback to do it, but we need to we need to see more Flatback I think because um they are always around like I say it's not just the festival the festival's huge now yes it's not just the festival they are around all the time yes. always putting stuff on I'm going to something next year actually I've already booked the tickets it's this escape car thing. Which I assume will be sort of film related as well. Right. You basically you book a car. I'm doing it with Matt. You book a car, and then you have to somehow escape. I don't really know what the deal is, but looking forward to it. All right. Well, um, thank you very much for <laughs> listening. We are eavesdropping at the movies. We're on uh, iTunes, uh, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Uh, on social media, we're on Facebook and Twitter, and uh, we're on eavesdropping at movies dot com. Cheerio. Bye bye. Uh. <laughs> Thank you.